Hey, Chris here from Mom Academy. Here to help you, yes you, make your game dev dreams become a reality. Today's part six, 16 of the AI series, we're talking about connecting additively loaded scenes that have discrete, already baked nav meshes. So if we have some level, and a player gets to the end of that level, and then they need to go to the next level, and you additively load that second level, how do you connect those two nav meshes? How we're gonna do it is add a nav mesh link at the beginning of the second scene that connects back to the first scene. So whenever you additively load that second scene, the nav mesh link is there that connects itself to the first level, and then the player can travel across that. There's a couple of caveats on how this works where we're gonna implement it a specific way, and if you try to do it a different way, it won't work the way you expect it to. So make sure you're paying close attention to how we implement this nav mesh link. And before we go any further, I just want to give a huge shout out to everyone who's supporting me on Patreon right now. I really appreciate it. Every bit helps the channel grow, reach more people, add value to more people, and that means that more people are making their game development dream become a reality. If you want to help me in that cause, you can show your support on Patreon, patreon.com slash academy. You can get your name up on the screen, you can get a voice shout out, and some other cool perks. We're going to start on the sample scene, and I'm actually going to copy everything that's in here. We're going to use this as the base of our additively loaded scenes. And then in the scenes folder, I'm going to create a new folder called additive scene loading. I'll go into that folder and create a new scene called additive scene one. And then I'll open that scene and paste the entire scene that I just copied from the sample scene and delete the original main camera and directional light. I also made some changes to how the click to move works because I noticed whenever I was clicking a lot of times it kind of sent me in random places. We'll do a video on the improved click to move in a little bit, but the important part, actually, you know what, Let, let's bake it in this one. I'm not going to do a separate video. We're going to do the improved movement in this one too. We need to change anything we actually want to click on to be on the floor layer. Then I'll bake the nav mesh because remember the scenario is we have two discrete levels with their own baked nav meshes. Then I'll copy the world geometry, create a new scene called additive scene 2, and paste the world geometry in there. When working with additive scenes you need to remember what's carried over from the previous scene like my player, my camera, and my directional light. So I'm actually going to remove the main camera and the directional light from the additive scene too and paste my world geometry in there. And actually I'm going to paste it twice that way I can align the one that I actually want to keep to be the correct spot whenever it loads that way I don't have to do any post loading moving around. Then I'll delete the world geometry where the first scene is and only keep the one where, that I want in this scene. I'm going to bake all of these nav meshes then let's set up the nav mesh link. I'll create an empty game object and I'll call it nav mesh links. And then in that, I'll create a child game empty game object called nav mesh link and attach the nav mesh link script to that. I'll shrink it down so the start point's negative 0.5z and end point is positive 0.5z. I'll also change the width to something really small like 1. And this is the really important part. If you have a really wide nav mesh link, your agents do not always correctly utilize it. I know in AI series part 2 I was talking about how great it is to have this really wide nav mesh link so that way the agent will go across links at any point on that width. And that's mostly true. If you check out this little clip right here of when I first implemented this with only a single nav mesh link that was the full width of the world geometry. You'll notice that the agents kind of hop around in weird ways and sometimes I'll click on the other side and then the player will run all the way up and then hop over and then like come back. The pathing doesn't work correctly with really wide nav mesh links. This seems to be a unity bug. What we're going to do instead is add a bunch of small nav mesh links over the width that the players and enemies should be able to cross. So on this nav mesh link, I will set the cost modifier to be one, the width to be one, and I'll leave the area type as walkable. I'll then copy the nav mesh link component and paste a new one for each agent type. So all agents can travel across this link. And then I'll copy paste this game object all the way down the walkable surface of the world geometry. So that way at any point on here, I have a nav mesh link I can take to get to the other side. Now that we've set up the additive scene two, so it'll link back to the first scene, let's set it up so the first scene will be able to additively load that second scene. 
scene. We'll open up Additive Scene 1, and I'm going to create a new ProBuilder object that just extends the full width of the world geometry where that connection is between the first and the second level. I'm going to set it to be a trigger, meaning it's an invisible collider game object. And whenever the player comes in here, we're going to get an on trigger enter event in that we'll do the setup to load the next scene. I'll also change the layer of this to be the enemy attack radius because on the physics layers that setup sort of will only collide with the player and that way I don't have to worry about this triggering a whole bunch of times and doing stuff we don't want. Then in the project panel we'll navigate to the scripts folder. I'll create a new folder again called additive scene loading and in there I'll create a new script called scene loader. We'll open up the scene loader and put a private serialized field scene name and set that to additive scene 2 by default. We'll also put the private void on trigger enter since this is a trigger which accepts the collider other and in there we'll do other.get component player does not equal to null meaning that it is a player. We'll do scene manager dot load scene async. You should almost never do just load scene because that causes a really big stutter and we'll pass in the scene name and say that we want to do the load scene mode additive and that would load our scene but if the player leaves and comes back into here we're going to try to reload that scene so scene manager actually returns something called an async operation we can create a private async operation load level operation set that to null by default and then assign that to be the return value of scene manager dot load scene async and whenever we check if the player is not null, we will check that the load level operation is null, meaning we've not tried to load the scene yet. That way we only trigger this one time. This is all we actually need to do in a script. Let's head over to the player movement to fix our kind of click to move not always working the way we expect it to. If we take a look at the update function, in here we're using physics.raycast and we're providing array and just getting the output. That works pretty well when there's not a lot of stuff obstructing the view like triggers. And remember now our enemies, almost all of them have large colliders around them checking for line of sight, their attack radius, that kind of stuff, which actually gets in the way of our raycast here because we haven't specified a layer mass. So what we'll do is at the top add a private serialized field layer mask call it layer mask and we'll use a different overloaded version of physics.raycast where we provide a max distance and a layer mask so we'll do physics.raycast ray out hit and we'll provide float.max value here because we don't actually care we want to go until we hit something and we'll provide the layer mask.value as the fourth argument and what that does is allows us to filter what we're raycasting against to only be on this particular layer, which is we'll set it to floor, which is why we need it at the beginning of the video to set up the world geometry to be on the floor layer. That's the only change here. If we hop back to the Unity editor, we'll select our trigger cube and attach the scene loader script to it. Since the scene name we set to default to be added to scene two, we don't need to change anything here. And we'll select our player. What I'm gonna do is set the health to be really high. That way I don't die whenever all these enemies are attacking me and we're just jumping back and forth between levels. I'll also change my damage to be zero. And on the player movement, the important thing is that we set the layer mask to be the floor and not nothing. If we set it to nothing, we won't be able to click on anything. And then if I click play, we see the enemy spawn and I'll start running towards the end of the level. Once I get there, we'll see that the new level comes into view. And if I click on that other level, we can see that my Unity Chan model will hop over the links to get to the other side. I can click freely from scene one or scene two and my Unity Chan model will go back and forth without any issue. I'll also see that the enemies follow me, the melee ones, no problem, hop back and forth with me and so can the ranged ones. I hope you got a lot of value out of today's video and you understand how to additively load a scene whenever the player enters a trigger and how to connect that new additively loaded scene to the previous scene so the player can traverse into the new scene seamlessly. If you have been getting value out of this video or the series, please consider liking and subscribing to help the channel grow, reach more people, and add value to more people. This new video is posted every Tuesday and sometimes on other days too. If you have any questions, if you have a suggestion for a topic like this one was, or if you're implementing AI into your game, drop a comment down below and I'll see you on the next video.